Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing the second part of the psychiatric emergencies. Now, if you guys don't know, on our first episode, on our first lecture, uh, we already covered half of the psychiatric emergencies. So go ahead and go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Mad Medicine, where you can find the first part of our lecture, uh, of our psychiatric emergencies lecture. We have USMLE Step 1 Psychiatry and Pharmacology playlist set up for you guys, and the lecture is located there. While you're there, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. It'll really help us out. We're posting new videos every single day. So let's now talk about psychiatric emergencies. Just a quick recap. These are usually caused by medications or other substances, and they must be treated right away. The reason why is that these acute disturbances in behavior and mood and thoughts can actually lead to harm for the patient, for the individual, and for others in the environment as well. And that's why you want to prevent uh, all the things that are happening. Now, these psychiatric emergencies are pretty, pretty um, uh, large in number when it comes to step one. And you definitely need to know each and every one of these in pretty good detail. You have to have a good understanding of what's happening. Now, the good thing is in this lecture, we're only going to be discussing these four, the top four from serotonin syndrome to delirium tremens have already been covered in part one of our psychiatric emergencies lecture. So with that being said, let's start our discussion by talking about the first psychiatric emergency we need to know in this lecture. And that that is acute dystonias. Acute dystonia is a symptom of the uh, L, um, the EPS, extrapyramidal signs, with antipsychotic use. The extrapyramidal symptoms more often occur in the high potency first generation antipsychotics like haloperidol, trifluperazine, and flufenazine. So these first generation high potency drugs is where it's usually associated with. Now this is the main difference between uh, first gen and second gen antipsychotics. So keep that in the back of your mind. All of this occurs due to blocking the postsynaptic D2 dopamine receptors in the nigrostriatal tract. And uh, the symptoms for these, uh, for these symptoms, the the symptoms are symptoms. Sorry, the symptoms for EPS symptoms are going to be Parkinson's disease-like presentation, and it's all going to present acutely. That's why we call it uh, uh, acute symptoms, right? Um, now, one thing to understand is why is this all happening like Parkinson's disease? Well, because you are blocking the D2 receptors, you're going to have high D1 receptor activation, which is going to lead to increased cyclic AMP. Now, because you have increased cyclic AMP, your body is going to have a negative feedback, and it's going to tell your brain, hey, stop producing dopamine so much. I don't need dopamine as much. That's going to lead to low, low dopamine levels, right? That's what's happening in your brain. Now, um, keep that in mind because that's exactly what happens in Parkinson's. In Parkinson's, you have low dopamine levels. So it's very similar. So in terms of the symptoms of acute, uh, sorry, of uh, the EPS symptoms, you're going to have acute dystonia, which occurs really quickly. This is uncontrollable muscle contractions that occur hour to hours to days from use. This is mainly our psychiatric emergency that must be treated right away. Okay, very important. You can also have akathisia, which is restlessness that occurs days to months. You'll have Parkinsonism, like uh, bradykinesia and tremors, the drug-induced Parkinsonism. And finally, you'll also have tardive dyskinesia. Usually, it's going to be oral facial, stiff, jerky movements, involuntary movements. And all of these have different timelines of occurrence. Usually, it's either days to months of usage of the drugs, or in, term, in, uh, in the case of tardive dyskinesias, it's going to be months to years of chronic use and often tardive dyskinesia is not treatable. So the acute dystonia is the main, main uh, uh, psychiatric emergency. And we have a cool little acronym for you guys, ADAPT, A-D-A-P-T. So don't forget this acronym because it will help you remember the symptoms. Now, when it comes to treatment, you can use a drug called benztropine. This is a anticholinergic uh, agent that blocks the M1 receptors, and it's going to improve the acute dystonia. So benztropine is the drug of choice. Now, keep in mind, you can also use benztropine to treat the akathisias and the drug-induced Parkinsonism. Uh, but mainly for acute dysto dystonia, benztropine is the way to go. So that's pretty much acute dystonia in a nutshell. The next psych emergency we're going to talk about today is lithium toxicity. Now we discussed lithium earlier in our previous lectures, but just a recap, lithium is a first line treatment for bipolar disorder, mainly because it prevents and treats the psychotic, or not the psychotic, the manic symptoms of bipolar disorder. So it's really, really important. Now there are five main side effects that occur with lithium. 
Three of them are very high yield, and the other two, in my opinion, you should just have in the back of your mind. But the first symptom that occurs very acutely is going to be tremors. Now, in this case, it's going to be very acute. It's going to be symmetric in the upper extremities, and it usually goes away after a while. This is a very common symptom, so uh, you might see this as a presentation, and then it'll go away. The other four are pretty important. Right, these are long-term effects that occur with lithium usage. The first one is hypothyroidism. Uh, lithium acts as a goitrogen, right? meaning it suppresses the release of the thyroid hormone. Now, what ends up happening is patients are going to present with the classic hypothyroid symptoms. Right, They're going to feel really tired. They're going to probably be gaining weight. So when you see that symptomology, the way you're going to treat lithium toxicity uh, or hypothyroid-induced, lithium-induced hypothyroidism, excuse me, is going to be simply by giving those patients levothyroxine. That's it. Right? They have low thyroid levels, and the simplest way to treat low thyroid is by supplementing thyroid. So you're going to give levothyroxine. You don't want to stop lithium in this case because there's a very, A, there's a very simple fix, and B, these patients usually need lithium in order to function properly and in order to prevent the, re, the recurrence of those bipolar manic symptoms. So you want to not stop lithium in patients who have hypothyroidism. Very high yield. All right. So this is the first thing you definitely need to know. The next thing you definitely need to know is going to be nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Again, long-term cause of lithium, a uh, long-term uh, side effect of lithium usage. This is going to be because of chronic tubular and interstitial nephropathy, which is going to lead to an inability to concentrate the urine and patients having uh, polydipsia and polyuria. Now, in this case, you do want to stop lithium if it's possible, but the main cause of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus in uh, bipolar patients is going to be a drug uh, interaction, uh, specifically lithium toxicity. Also very high yield. The next side effect is the cardiac side effects of long-term use, which is going to be suppression of the sinus node, leading to bradycardia and syncope. And finally, the last thing you need to know, very high yield, is going to be Epstein's anomaly. Okay, Epstein's anomaly is an atrioventricular displacement of the tricuspid valve. Usually the valve becomes lower in position than it should be, more so in the ventricle than in the atria. Now this is because lithium is teratogenic and it can completely equilibrate across the placenta. So in pregnant patients who have bipolar disorder, you want to get them off of lithium. Okay, that's very, very important. In this case, you also want to stop lithium in pregnant patients. So that's lithium toxicity in a nutshell. The next, uh, the third of the four psychiatric emergencies is going to be the tricyclic antidepressant toxicity. This is usually used, tri TCAs are usually used for major depressive disorder, OCD, peripheral neuropathy, chronic pain, and migraine prophylaxis. So uh, what you want to do in this case, in patients who have tricyclic antidepressant disorder, is be uh, you want to give mainly... Uh, um, uh, several things. But first, let's talk about overdose. What ends up happening in these patients is that they're going to have uh, the tricyclics or uh, the, t the three C's for their side effect uh, profile, right? That's how we remember it, tricyclics. So the first C stands for convulsions or seizures. This is because TCAs have a GABA antagonistic effect, right? You're also going to have... Um, Excuse me. You're also going to have the anticholinergic or antimuscarinic effects like hyperthermia, flushing, ileus, and meiosis. You'll also have patients who present with alpha-1 blockade like uh, hypotension or the static hypotension or coma and death even in certain cases. So this is the second C, coma. And then you'll have patients who present with prolonged QT interval, which will lead to ar arrhythmia and torsade de pointe. And this is the cardiotoxicity portion, right? This right here. And then finally, this can also, uh, this is all due to blockade of the cardiac sodium channels, by the way. The prolonged QT is happening because TACAs are going to block the cardiac sodium channels, and it's going to act similar to a type 1 antiarrhythmic, okay? So um, that is what's happening here. And then you can also have depression with TCA toxicity. Now, when you're treating TCA toxicity, you want to first look at the supportive care, meaning make sure the patient is okay, their vitals are good, their EKG is good, because you want to make sure they're not having QT prolongation, they're not going into an, uh, an arrhythmia or having torsade de points occurring. Then what you want to do is make sure the patient is on sodium bicarbonate. Now, the extra sodium is going to overcome the TCA uh, sodium channel, cardiac sodium channel blockade. 
That's why you want to give sodium bicarbonate. And you can also give uh, activated charcoal in order to bind to the, the TCA and inactivate the whole substance itself. So that's one way you can also treat TCA toxicity. Usually when it comes to step one, remember, try to keep this in the back of your mind, sodium bicarbonate is given in order to overwhelm the uh, sodium channels by binding it with sodium instead of uh, um, the tricyclic antidepressant binding to the cardiac sodium channel. So sodium bicarbonate is very important for tricyclic antidepressants. Now, finally, the very last psychiatric emergency is going to be suicidal thoughts and uh, suicidal tendencies. Now, nearly 45,000 people in the United States have suicidal thoughts uh, at all times, and this is a a huge risk factor and warning. Now, usually, suicidal thoughts can occur in mental disorders, especially like major depressive disorders, substance abuses can cause it, or even psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia. Now, what another thing you want to watch out for as far as risk factors are going to be someone who's had a previous attempt. This is probably one of the highest, highest uh, side effects or the highest risk factors, excuse me, of suicidal thoughts of someone committing suicide. So you want to look at previous suicide attempts. People who are gay, lesbian, part of the LGBTQ community are also at a higher risk simply because of the societal factors that are associated with the LGBTQ community even in this day and age. If they have a personal uh, history of physical abuse or sexual abuse, they're at a higher risk. And then if they have a family history and uh, of suicidal behavior, they're at a higher risk. Now, immediate psychiatric evaluation or hospitalization is indicated when a patient says that they have a plan made to kill themselves. When they have an intent to die with a plan, you have to intervene. It's very, very important because that is classified as a psychiatric emergency. The reason why I am putting this statement right here is because while I was studying for step one, I remember vividly on one of the test banks, I got a question that asked me about a patient who told me that he planned to kill himself on uh, the anniversary of his wife's death. The question then asked me, what is the appropriate next step? And that was immediate hospitalization. Okay, so therefore, you should definitely know that if a patient presents with suicidal thoughts and tendencies, okay, they say, yes, I do have suicidal thoughts and and tendencies, and you ask them, have you made a plan to commit suicide? And they say, yes, and you ask them about the plan, you need to make sure that the patient is stable and uh, psychiatric evaluation is done before you let the patient go. So that is the last of our psychiatric emergencies that you need to know about. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to this channel if you guys haven't already done so. And if you don't know, you can find all of our podcasts on any, all of our lectures are on your favorite podcast provider for free. Just search Mad Medicine and we will pop up. Thank you again for listening and watching and continue on to the next lecture.